those are very powerful people. And the fact that they're getting together in secrecy, I think is a problem. What I think is like a huge red flag is that its existence was denied by the media and the elites up until the 90s. I'm Stephanie Keith. And I am Tara Manjekovic. And we are Unapologetically Outspoken. Hey everyone, welcome back to the podcast. So today we're going to do a little bit of a conspiracy type episode uh, because I came across something that I've never heard of before. Um, You know, we've all heard of these like elite families, like the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers, but Tara, have you ever heard of the Wallenbergs? Not until you brought them up when we talked about doing this episode. Yeah, I hadn't either. And apparently they're the richest family in the world and they own over $275 billion and employ over 1 million people in their various businesses. And I guess they're this prominent Swedish family and they own businesses across industries like banking, pharmaceuticals, industrial groups like Ericsson and Atlas. And they make up 40% of the total Swedish stock market. And I can't believe I've never heard of them because one of the companies they own is AstraZeneca, which I used to work for. Never heard of them. Um, And what's crazy is they even own the NASDAQ stock exchange. So it's like you think we would have heard something about this family just from that alone. But I guess they have ties to the White House and the World Economic Forum And I want to know, like, why have we never heard of them? And like, why aren't they ever on the Forbes wealthiest people list or any of those lists that come out that talk about all the elites? And the answer is because they don't want people to know, like they want to stay hidden in the shadows where people aren't asking too many questions. So I want to talk about someone who had like put the spotlight on them originally and raised some big red flags. And that was none other than Donald Trump. So I found a video um, where Trump raised alarms on their company Ericsson for selling telecom equipment to oppressive governments like Sudan, Syria, and Iran. And they said that they used this equipment for things like monitoring and controlling their own people. And Trump said the U.S. government began looking into this in 2009, and around that same time, Erickson sponsored Bill Clinton's speech, paying him $750,000 for one speech. I guess this is the most he's ever been paid for a speech. It's probably the most anyone has ever been paid for a speech. Um, And then in 2012, Obama issued sanctions on the telecom sales to Iran and Syria, But they left out Ericsson as one of the companies that got the sanctions. So, Tara, this was the point when I realized that the people who I thought were the puppeteers, like the Clintons and the Obamas, are actually probably subservient to a bigger and more powerful group of elite families that are just hiding under the radar that we don't even know about. Um, And I want to back up for a second because I didn't even know or realize what this company Ericsson was or like what they did. Um, But they own the infrastructure for the internet in 184 countries that spans 2.3 billion people. So that's a lot of power. I mean, we talk all the time about like the mainstream media controlling, you know, what's being communicated, but this family basically owns the internet. And like, just think about that for a second. It's like, if they wanted to shut it down, they absolutely could. If they wanted to work with various governments to shut down internet access for like certain areas or certain countries, they could. And they also own all of the 5G towers. So basically like all of the infrastructure that runs our technology, which runs our world is in their hands. And we've never even heard of them. And Ericsson is just one of their many companies. Um, another company they own called ABB, Contr- uh, ABB controls the power grid. And then another company called Atlas controls mining. So while I was doing all of this research on this family, I looked up Jacob 
Wallenberg. And I guess he was one of the founding members of the Bilderberg Group in 1954, which was meant to be a communication strategy like worldwide where Europe and the United States could work together. And a lot of people are saying, like, create this new world order post-World War II. And I've heard of Bilderberg. There's so many conspiracy theories around this group. But what I want to know is, like, if I thought that's what NATO was for. Like, NATO was formed after World War II for that reason. So why the need for another group that's super secretive unless there's some sort of alternative, like, nefarious purpose? Okay, I have to say when I started doing research on the family, like almost everything was focused on their philanthropic efforts. And when I looked into it, they've honestly done some pretty cool shit historically, especially like during World War II, because of all their wealth and their power and their influence. They saved like thousands of Jews from Nazi persecution. And one of the family members, I guess, was working as a diplomat in Budapest. I think his name was Raoul. And he used his position to secure like protective passports for Jewish refugees and the family established safe houses and hospitals and schools. And they, you know, basically saved a lot of Jews from the Nazis and did some pretty heroic undercover shit. But then after the war, the family used their power and influence to become pretty heavily involved in politics and like shaping government policy in Sweden. But like you said, they kept it all totally secretive. And this has been ongoing. Um, there's this like ongoing speculation that this family basically controls all of Europe. And when you mentioned Ericsson, I always thought that was just an electronics company. And so I had no idea that it had such expansive influence. And then as far as like the Bilderberg group being created, I read an article that came out in the Independent UK in 2019. And it was saying this group was formed because the founders were concerned because there was all this anti-American sentiment in post-war Europe. And so they wanted to revive what they called, quote, the spirit of transatlantic brotherhood based on political, economic, and military cooperation during the Cold War. And that the whole purpose of this was like to counter the USSR's tightening grip on Eastern European countries and that their agenda was really just to prevent another war. But it seems like that focus has shifted. And so now they're just like, gaining secretive global dominance. Yeah. And I would say instead of preventing wars, they're probably part of the military industrial complex at this point. Um, but I want to get into like what Bilderberg is because a lot of people probably haven't even heard of it. I only recently found out about this group and it's a meeting of like the most elite people in the world. So you think about all the elite people we know, there are people even more elite at like the tippy top of the pyramid, most of which we don't know because they don't want to be known. Like, so it's very interesting. It's like this whole other world and it spans governments. And, you know, a lot of people think that they basically control the world. And it's believed that like, this is where the globalists meet to discuss the plans for the new world order. So this is really when this whole globalist agenda started taking form after World War II. And what's what I think is like a huge red flag is that its existence was denied by the media and the elites up until the 90s. So this was like going on in complete secrecy for decades. And it kind of reminds me of Bohemian Grove, where they say, oh, it's just a boys club. You know, we just camp out when really we know that there's a lot more going on at these secret societies of the elites around the world. Um, and so all of their meetings are very secretive. And up until recently, no one knew what they discussed. They've had members like Henry Kissinger, Bill Clinton. And also, I read that every president has someone close to them that will attend these meetings. And I was really surprised to find out that Jared Kushner, who is Trump's son-in-law, is a member. And now you have all of these big AI players that have become members as well. And I don't know. Like, I just think that the fact that everything is so tight-lipped makes me think 
there's something bad going on, you know, like there's no transparency and people like Alex Jones and like a few others are the only reason why we even know about this group and why the media had to, you know, look into it. And um, up until then they denied it, but now they have like a website where they don't really list a whole lot. They have like members and then they have agenda items and the 2023 meeting included AI, the banking system, China, energy transition, Europe, fiscal challenges, India, industrial policy and trade, NATO, Russia, transnational threats, Ukraine, and U.S. leadership. So like all of the hot button topics we talk about on this podcast, and again, like this is what I thought things like NATO or like the UN were supposed to be doing, but they talk about that here as well. And while they've been, you know, forced to admit that, yes, this is a real group, um, like I said, it's still very secretive. And like the only um, way that we know about this is from things that are leaked. And they say that the reason for this is they want members to feel like they can speak their mind without anyone finding out about like who said what. Yeah, I was reading an article about this in the Epic Times, and it was talking about, I guess, the last Bilderberg meeting was this past May in Portugal. And I, I swear, I keep wanting to say build a bear. Like, you know <laughs> yeah. what I'm talking about? Like build a bear workshop? Yeah. Isn't that like some big teddy bear toy store? Oh, like, yeah. My kids love it. <laughs> that's what comes to mind. Every time I say Bilderberg, my mind goes build a bear. Um, but anyway, I, I read that they have this protocol called the Chatham House Rules, and that's like their you know, rule that allows all of these elites and power players to freely use the information that they talk about in these meetings, but they can't identify who any of the speakers are and everyone's supposed to remain anonymous. And um, I read another article that one I mentioned from The Independent that said the guest list for these meetings aren't even published until the day before the meeting happens. But the members of the Bilderberg group insist that they're merely just a debating side, a debating society. And like, yeah, I'm not buying that, right? Like it, like you said, this definitely has like Bohemian Grove vibes. Yeah, it's like the most wealthy and powerful people in the world are just part of a little debating club, like a little debate club. You know, there's there's no way. There's more going out there. Um I guess they they typically meet at a hotel, you know, and it changes. So that way people can't really um, show up or whatever. And they said that hotel staff have like secretly recorded parts of the meetings. So there are some things that have leaked out here and there. I saw one video where Alex Jones like showed up, like somehow he had figured out where it was and he showed up and he was like screaming at them. And there were like military armed people um outside which is like crazy and then i've seen people approaching like different members and and asking what was discussed and like they f- look very uncomfortable and they will not say a word and i think that it's this secrecy that's causing all of these conspiracies it's like what do you think is going to happen of course people are going to be suspicious when you have the biggest leaders of like industry and the banking system and politics all gather in this secretive meeting that's off the books to discuss these major world issues. And it just kind of makes you think like, if we truly vote anyone in, and if we have any say in anything, or do these people simply make the decisions and then let us believe that we have some sort of input in what's going on? Yeah. And that's, that's funny because that's exactly what was highlighted in that article I referenced from the Epic Times, I guess there was a journalist at this past meeting in May, and he said, quote, it seems like an awful lot of senior European politicians to be discussing vital topics such as Ukraine, Russia, and NATO with no senior NATO officials and with no press oversight and no press conference. And this reporter also talked about how the MSM is reluctant to cover Bilderberg meetings. And he said that they seem to be like a blind spot in mainstream media and that there are all these rumors about how the whole purpose of the meetings is for the elites and these world leaders to get together in secret and strategize about creating the new world order. And then there are these theories that like the Bilderberg group was behind the creation of the European Union and then also the invasion of Iraq. 
And this article I read gave a full list of the participants from around the world at this past conference. And it, there was somewhere around like 130 people. And I'll be honest, I've never heard of like the probably 95, 96% of these people. I only recognized a few names, but I want to read off some of the participants from the United States alone and who they work for, because I think it's very telling when you look at what these people do for a living. So Stacey Abrams, that's one of the few names I recognized. Uh, she's the CEO of SageWorks and very outspoken, you know, liberal. You have Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI, Anne Applebaum, a staff writer at The Atlantic, Sally Benson, professor of energy science and engineering at Stanford, Albert Buria, chair and CEO of Pfizer, Tarun Chabra, senior director for technology and national security for the National Security Council, Brian Deese, former director of the National Economic Council, Jen Easterly, director of the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, Kenneth Griffin, founder and CEO of Citadel, Avril Haynes, director of national intelligence, Alex Karp, CEO of Palantir Technologies, Gary Kasparov, chair of the Renewed Democracy Initiative, Henry Kissinger, who I mentioned in a recent podcast, I really thought he was dead. Um, John Micklethwaite, editor-in-chief of Bloomberg. Satya Nadella, CEO of Microsoft. Eric Schmidt, former CEO and chair of Google. John Walden, Waldron, president and COO of Goldman Sachs. Thomas Wright, senior director for strategic planning at the National Security Council. And Daniel Jurgen, vice chair of S&P Global. So this list of people from the United States are what? They're left-wing liberal elites and CEOs of multi-million dollar companies and people with ties to national security. Like, don't you think that seems a bit odd for a supposed debating society? Well, yeah, and it's really scary when you read that list. It's like a handful of people could completely alter what's happening in the world. Like, those are very powerful people. And the fact that they're getting together and secrecy, I think, is a problem. Um, at least, you know, like the World Economic Forum and some of these other places, like you you kind of like see videos and you know what's being debated. And I I'm sure they are debating, but just like Congress debates over which bills get passed, this group is probably debating on the very things that are going to shape our future. And again, like it's the secrecy that bothers me. Mm -hmm. I think that as we keep digging like deeper down this rabbit hole, we're seeing a lot of this stuff come up and like the world seems like it really is run by secret societies. And like this whole Washington politics and government thing is one big theatrical performance to keep us distracted and to keep us thinking that we actually have a say of like what's going on in the world. That's yeah. my take on it. <laughs> yeah. And it you can trace that back through history too. If you look at you know, like the Illuminati and even the Masons and all the mm -hmm. secret societies like that, all of the prominent members of those societies throughout history have all been prominent political figures. Yeah. There's so many secret societies. That's what I found when I was looking at this. And I'm just like, this is, it's crazy. And I think it was JFK that said, um, that we need to put an end to like the the whole thing with secret societies he called it out and then he was assassinated shortly after so i think there's something there um especially when we have a government that is so big on transparency 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 and yet this is clearly the, they're involved in the complete opposite of transparency oh yeah absolutely especially like we know this administration is not actually running things. It's it's very apparent. And so it's interesting, all of these different groups, like who's running what, I don't know, but it's definitely not the government. So um, I'm sure we'll have more of the different secret societies because there's a whole list of them. But I know Bilderberg is like a pretty big one. And um, the fact that I had trouble finding stuff on this just shows like I'm sure they go to great lengths to scour the internet and make sure things are deleted. Yeah. So anyhow, uh, that's our little conspiracy theory for today. I hope you enjoyed it and we'll see you back here next time. Thanks for tuning in.
If you're sick of all the crazy shit going on in our country and you want to express your support and patriotism for the show, head on over to our Etsy store at UO Patriot Chicks and check out our new stickers. The link can also be found on our website. If you love the show and you want exclusive episodes, support the podcast and join the conversation by becoming a member of our Patreon community. We'll be posting weekly member-only podcast episodes and content that isn't available on the weekly podcast. Every Patreon member will also get a free, unapologetically outspoken sticker and updates about our new sticker release before they're made public. And be sure to follow us on TikTok at Unapologetically Outspoken. And if you haven't done so already, please rate and review the podcast. The more you support us, the more people we can reach. So help us spread the word.